You are listening to the Stand Out Now podcast with your host, Dave Mendonca. Check out each episode as top experts share their proven marketing, publicity, and sales tips to help you cut through the advertising noise so you can reach your ideal clients, get noticed, and connect with powerful influencers. The Stand Out Now podcast is brought to you by podcastinterviewexperts.com. Helping entrepreneurs attract clients through business podcast guest appearances. Hey, how's it going? Thank you for listening. Our guest started in Canadian radio and has become an award-winning podcast producer, podcast expert, and now the author of the book, Let's Talk Podcasting, The Essential Guide to Doing It Right. Amanda Capito, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. My pleasure, Amanda. Now, let me begin with a question that I begin with all my guests. When you were a kid, what marketing or sales strategies, knowingly or unknowingly, did you use to get what you wanted? So one of my earliest memories of using some of those strategies was when I was younger, I was in grade school, and I really wanted to be on the radio. And so what I would do is call in to radio stations when my class was on field trips <laughs> from random phones, like pay phones or sometimes landlines that I would have access to somehow. But I would coordinate all the students to say certain things when I put the phone to them. Essentially, I was coordinating live hits. Um, <laughs> and This is maybe grade seven or eight. And I would call into FM radio stations and they would be recording and usually looking for call in people to call in. And I just wanted to get on air. And I knew that if I had planned something really epic, that it, that it would probably make it. And so, yeah, I was very successful in always getting on the radio with these live hits from field trips as like 13 year old. OK, OK, let's back up the U-Haul truck right now. All right. Let's, <laughs> I want to figure this out. I want to get into your brain a bit. So. You're 13 years old. How the heck do you have this idea in the first place to uh, coordinate such an endeavor? I, well, I've always loved radio and I was a big listener. I'd always have FM stations on in the background when I was at home. And so I kind of had this sense that if I was just calling from home, which I would do all the time as well, like borderline psychotic, but I wouldn't always make it on the air. I would try to request a song or like say something funny, but sometimes they would just give me a shout out or they just wouldn't even play it at all. So I knew I had to be elaborate and stand out with my call. And I thought the best way to do that was when I had lots of people around that I could leverage. And so, and field trips middle of the day was usually an easier time to get on air. I started tracking timing and I knew that people weren't really calling during the work day. And in my case, the school day. And so, uh, yeah, just trying to leverage the components that I was piecing together from the radio world, even at a young age. Oh, my goodness. Like, when I was 13, I didn't have like intricate plans <laughs> To, like stuff For that anything, you, right? you it's just cra- that's alone. just crazy amanda so wait a second like you convince fellow classmates to go on the phone as well or is it just yeah. wow like i would say when i point the phone to you you got to do a big woohoo or something and so then i would say and i would like throw to them essentially i'd be like and then i'm here with the students at this school with me everybody scream and i would like put the phone out and get everyone to cheer <laughs> like what an awareness like to know that to leverage those people around you to get on the phone would get you a better opportunity to be on the air like uh, I got, as a 13 year old I just don't understand how you would have thought <laughs> that at that age I have no idea and then once oh. I realized once that it worked and that they would always put me on air if I did that I just leveraged it continually so every field trip that was oh. it became my shtick they're like Amanda are you gonna call the radio station like oh. we all want to go on the radio <laughs> so how'd you persuade the students oh people were pretty easily persuaded because especially I was leading it and I was just really doing the throw. Sometimes I'd get them to chant the radio station. That always made it to air. So, you know. <laughs> wow. Okay. So now that I got this story, so you have powers of persuasion. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, that does work to my favor. Project right managing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And yeah. So like, how did you use those skills? Like, see, that's a golden nugget from when you were a kid. How did you apply those to like future gigs? I think it's not even the power of persuasion as much as when I'm genuinely enthusiastic about something, it really shows and mm. I can't help but want to get people on board and want to talk about it. So even with podcasting now, even before I wrote my book, I was just talking to everyone about podcasts and I 
started to brand myself as this podcast person in very early days of me working in that space. And so, but it's just because I was genuinely interested, genuinely excited about it. And I would make it come up in conversation. And then by the end of conversations, people were walking away saying, I feel like I should start a podcast. I'm like, yeah, wasn't really my goal, but you know, it just can't, it just happened that way. Cause the enthusiasm definitely, uh, is noticeable. It's contagious. I had that start because you're talking about, okay, radio, you started in radio. I read that CFRB was a big part of early on in your career. So describe the, the eventual migration to podcasting. There's a, a little bit you have to, to talk about there in terms of CFRB and whatnot. Can you just let the listeners know uh, what your uh, origin story has become? Yeah, sure. So I, I started at CFRB as a producer of a midday show, and I spent a couple years doing that. But even in that capacity, I was getting um, people contacting me just because they knew I had audio editing skills. And that was right around the time that podcasting was starting to, you know, make its place, become a name, become a word people were familiar with. And so I was starting just to take on one off projects more so just because I knew I had the skill set to do it, not necessarily because I thought it was going to be a business venture for myself. And I enjoy audio storytelling through and through. And so I thought, why not? And so I started doing these lots of projects for thought leaders, really, and creating mini series for them. And then I ended up spending some time in radio. I did end up venturing into FM radio for a brief stint as a morning show co-host. I came back to CFRB to do reporting and news anchoring. And then during that time, I really started gaining an awareness of the podcasting industry. And I was tracking how it was starting to evolve. And I really saw potential with it. And then during that time, I transitioned to working at a digital content agency where we were producing mainly branded video with a real journalistic style. And so we were doing authentic interviews, unscripted um, conversations that we would cut into like, you know, mini teaser trailer videos for companies. And with that, I launched at this company, I launched a branded podcast vertical, Hmm. where I was doing essentially the same sort of thing, but for podcasting for brands. And then from there, that really was the catalyst around that time. It was 2014, 2015, and Serial had just come out. Now there was a real appetite for podcasts. And it went really quick from there till now, which led to me producing several series for some of my own clients and writing the book. Wow. Okay. There's a lot to dig in there, Amanda. Um, I forgot (laughs) to mention to the listeners, uh, outside of Canada, a CFRB 1010 is a radio station in Toronto, Canada. So if you're wondering what the heck CFRB, there you go. Now, Amanda, in regards to just your arc there, uh, your career arc, so the thought leader stuff, uh, helping thought leaders, how did you convince people to like believe in you? Like, hey, there's this Amanda podcasting lady. I I trust her to work with me on getting uh, podcasting out there and stuff like that. In the beginning, it was word of mouth. Again, it came to me and it was very organic in the way it started. And again, I didn't think much of it. I wasn't trying to build a podcast empire at that time by any means. And what ended up happening from my perspective was I was just meeting some really amazing leaders who I got along with. And then I had the skills to complement some of the goals they were trying to achieve. And so it just ended up being really good fits, more so personality wise and skill set wise. So it just made sense. But the real shift when I was really doing more strategic pitching and trying to sell myself as a podcaster really did. Number one came when I was at the digital content agency. It was called Media Face, also located in Toronto. First was pitching the founder on the reasons why we should actually invest in building out a podcast vertical. And from there, I was forward facing with clients where I was selling podcasts. And at that time, my enthusiasm definitely helped me and served me well in those spaces. But a lot of times, especially at that time around 2014, a lot of my clients didn't necessarily know what a podcast was, or if they did, they just had a general idea and maybe had only heard one or two. And so what it came down to was I was creating a lot of pilots, a ton of pilots, a ton of teasers to give people a sense of what what it could sound like for them. So actually, there's a lot of brilliant pilot episodes I've made that (laughs) have not been published and have gone nowhere and the client didn't end up purchasing it, but really brilliant stuff. I'm biased, I guess. But anyway, um, I created a lot of samples to try to get people on board. So are you talking like scripting, producing, editing, all of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like a slickly produced episode one of what 
a series of theirs could look like. Like now the, the industry has changed where you're just ha- branded podcasting. I, you know, you're getting people understand what it is for the most part. They're coming to you already, maybe with some ideas. Whereas at that time, I just felt like we weren't quite there yet, especially especially in the Canadian market mm-hmm. where brands weren't necessarily thinking that they should be spending all of their marketing dollars on audio. They were still really loving video. And we were, or, and as a company, as at MediaFace, we were selling branded video. And so it was just easier and I think safer in their eyes to continue to invest in video rather than spread their marketing dollars out to some audio experiment <laughs> from their perspective. Yeah, I find we are playing catch up up here in Canada. The Americans are all over it. They yeah. see the value and it's growing at a steady pace down there. But I guess we're just too conservative up here, I guess. I don't know. We're afraid of new stuff. And it's not proven. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. And, I, and we're getting there. There's already been quite a shift since 2014. At least I'm not having to spend a lot of my time explaining what is a podcast <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Um, when, when it's funny to think that just four years ago, I always did have to start off my presentations that way. Right. Exactly. Now you're talking about the branded podcasts. So when did you start realizing that was a viable commercial thing for people? What, like, did you see other companies doing it and like, whoa, that's an idea. Yeah. So I was already thinking in this sort of way when I was building out the vertical at Media Face, but I was quickly sensing that I was just a little bit too early given our location and given our current client base. Mm. And around that time, Pacific Content launched also out of Canada, which they produce uh, branded podcasts as well and have clients across Canada and the US. So I noticed them right away. I mean, I was already tracking the industry quite closely, especially the Canadian landscape. And so I did connect with them right off the bat and I've continued to have connections with them. And Chris Boyce, one of their principals, actually wrote the foreword to my book and we've Um, remained in touch. And we had quite similar visions at the same time for the potential of branded podcasting and branded content as a whole. And both of us have background as journalists. We had a, a real heart to heart about how a lot of journalists were still looking at branded content as some sort of dirty word the dark side, Hmm. not true storytelling. And it's quite the opposite. It's great storytelling. And you're actually able to make a couple bucks from it, which, you know, I think is a win-win. So what is good audio storytelling to you? That's a big question. I think (laughs) I like really thoughtful audio storytelling. And that's like taking into account the audience that you're trying to target and the type of story you're trying to tell and the best way to tell that story. So I find that sometimes there are amazing stories that people try to incorporate into a podcast, for instance, and a chat cast like this one I'm on right now and having this kind of conversation in this format makes sense. This is a great way to to have these kinds of stories being told. But there are people who have different kinds of stories that then default to this as a format And that's when I feel like some of that potential for great audio storytelling is lost, is when you find yourself just defaulting to what you think is the most popular format and not really actually thinking story first. You got to always be thinking story first and thinking audience, right? Those are the two pieces. So what's my audience? How are they consuming it? Do they have five minutes to listen to this or do they have half an hour? And then thinking about what's the best way to present this story and making that lead your decision-making process. So what are some examples of really stellar audio storytelling? Are there particular podcasts that you're a massive fan of? I think everything Gimlet touches is pretty (laughs) brilliant. And Mm. I know I'm not alone in, in thinking that. But even something as simple as Startup, which was their first series, obviously, that they launched with season one. And that could have easily, you know, Alex Bloomberg could have easily defaulted into turning that topic into a chat cast format, right? Where he talked about what he was struggling with on a week to week or month to month basis with starting a business, interviewing people that he met along the way, right? Like he could have really defaulted to that format, but it wouldn't have done the justice and it wouldn't have been as amazing as it was with what it came out to be, which is where he was recording conversations with his wife that was who was making fun of his shoe choices. (laughs) And he was recording pitches gone wrong in Silicon Valley. And so that kind of colorful audio is really what made that series sing. And I tend to use that. I mean, that was one of the, that came out in 2014 as well. And it was one of those podcasts I held up on a pedestal 
when I was developing the vertical up media face in those days. And so, yeah, I still hold them up, For up sure. on a pedestal. For sure. Yeah. And now, Amanda, I want to uh, tap into your podcasting expertise uh, a little further in regards to helping entrepreneurs. Like uh, a lot of the listeners to this podcast are entrepreneurs. They're looking to market themselves in different ways to get through all the advertising noise out there. And personally, I think podcasting is one of those things that could cut through. Just wondering from your point of view, how can this platform, this medium be a, a profitable way for entrepreneurs to connect with their ideal audiences? Yeah. So, I mean, the research already speaks for itself that there is, you know, you have great listenership, listenership's growing year to year. You have great retention rates where people are listening through to podcasts all the way to the end. Once they click on an episode, they're usually committed to the episode, unlike any other medium, really. Even with ads, there's branded content and there's ads placements. But in both capacities, we're seeing really great results, return on investment, brand recognition, and listenership affinity to brands that advertise on podcasts. So across the board, I mean, those numbers speak for themselves, I think. And even just the rates of how many podcast listeners have purchased things that they've heard about in a podcast, they say 60% or 60 somewhat percent of people who listen to podcasts have purchased things that they heard about on a podcast. So these are numbers that are a marketer's dreams. So aside from that, though, you're talking about cutting through. And I think really what this comes down to from a content perspective is that there is a lot of noise out there. And to be honest, there's a lot of podcasts out there. But when taking the right time, the strategic time to produce a podcast that is really intentional with how they're going about sharing stories and sharing information, it does cut through even within the podcast space because a lot of people are still very much experimenting. And sadly, a lot of the podcasts don't last very long, right? Most podcasts end up being in production for six months and then they're done. They call it quits. So if you actually have a great plan, and something with a little bit of longevity, and you've actually invested the time and effort into doing your research into your audience, to your content, the best way of prefacing that and presenting that content, and committing to it for you know at least a year, mm-hmm. I think there's a real opportunity to, to stand out. For sure. Now, in your opinion, what would be more effective for a small business owner, entrepreneur, appear as a guest on a relevant podcast to their industry, or host a podcast that is relevant to their industry? Which do you think has more like more attraction that would reach out to more people? You know, there's no right or wrong answer to that question. I think in some instances, appearing as a guest can be really great. And then the other side of things that, you know, you could find real success in producing your own content. I would suggest that you make that decision based on your comfort level in the podcast space. If you're unsure about the podcast space, maybe appearing on podcasts might be a good first step to dip your toe in, see how you feel, see how you sound. Because also getting a spot on a big podcast right off the bat, I mean, that you're going to see instant success and instant reward from a quick win like that. So that's a great way to get a quick win Mm -hmm. um, and dip your toe into the space. But if you're looking for something more of a long-term plan, you know that you want to produce some sort of branded content. And you're able to put in the time and the resources to produce, again, like a really intentional mini series or an ongoing podcast, and you think you have what it takes to sustain it, then yeah, the latter can also really serve you. Beautiful. Now, uh, I don't know. I think both avenues are long game plays. Like, let's, you know, I have my own little guest booking agency and I, I deal with people who are not monster celebrities, right? So, you're not going to be on Tim Ferriss's podcast off the top, right? Right. Yeah. It's a long game play. So in my opinion, you don't need to have to be on like a massive podcast to gain traction. As long as it's relevant, you find your audience, find your people that will need what you're putting out there, you're going to be fine. But it's not going to happen like with a snap of the finger. So it, no. I yeah. think and, both and it's niche audiences too, right? Podcasting allows you to target niche. So just because it's not the Joe Rogan podcast with huge audiences, who are those audiences, right? Like mm. it, you want to target someone that's strategic to what, who you're trying to speak to. So even if you get a podcast placement with, you know, a couple thousand downloads every month, but those are the exact 1000 people you want to target, then Bingo. Hey, that's a win. Bingo. There's a lot of like radio thinking here. I think I interviewed somebody, a podcast one, like they have big radio thinking, they're radio guys. And they're like, we need numbers. 
millions of listeners. <laughs> that's how we do it. But yeah. then I'm like, no, man, like I've had clients where I put them on a real estate podcast that just launched. And all of a sudden the guy gets a deposit on a $60,000 program. You know what I mean? I like, yeah. Yeah, it's what you said. It's you got to narrow down that niche, find your people. And it doesn't have to be a monster podcast. Yeah. And that is so easy to do through podcasting. And it is something that is quite hard to do through traditional radio because radio is so geographical, right? And so already you're limiting yourself as far as audience goes based on location. And that is usually not where your specificity is with regard to targeting audiences for as far as a business or a brand goes. So, I mean you do have to have a completely different mindset. Great audio storytelling will do well on radio, do well as a podcast, yeah, sure. sure. But um, yeah, the mechanics all around it, it definitely differs. Definitely. So Amanda is quite the podcast expert and typically uh, many experts, they like writing books. And she's got one out. Let's talk podcasting. Now, how did this come to be? Like, when did you, when did you get that lightning strike of inspiration? I actually... <laughs> To be honest, again, kind of the opportunity fell in my lap. I wasn't even thinking about writing a book, but I was doing a series of workshops and panel discussions about podcasting in Toronto within the city. And one of my presentations, I had a publisher in the audience who approached me afterward and it. said, you should just turn that entire presentation into a book. <laughs> and in the moment, I thought, well, oh, that sounds easy. Sure. She goes, yeah, like that's your book. So that ended up actually being like five pages of the book. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, so a lot more work had to go into it. But yeah, I was pleasantly surprised to be approached with the opportunity. So it was PPS Publishing that published my book. And they're known for trying to leverage female thought leaders. So it was it ended up being a really good fit to have me as one of their authors. And it's been great to have the opportunity to write a book, which includes a little bit of everything, a, a history of podcasting, a, an analysis of the current landscape, predictions for future, and then a section on how to do it yourself and a behind the scenes look at how I've produced some of my own. So it's really all encompassing and a nice, yeah, a nice go-to package. Well, congratulations on the book. Listen, books are hard to write. How long did it take you to pen that sucker? Oh, it took me two years, Whoa! which <laughs> as you can imagine, I had to update a lot of the stats and information oh, man. as I was going along, but I was on and off with it and I didn't have hard deadlines in the beginning. And like any journalist, I need a hard deadline <laughs> and then I'll meet it. <laughs> so yeah. I actually attended the Work It podcast conference last year, the WNYC conference that was held in LA last year. And after that, I was really inspired to just get it done. I felt mm. so empowered. It, it was a real, there was a real energy. And I also took a lot of ideas that I then built upon and applied to my own work and was able to really write about. And so that actually also ended up being a real pillar as an inspiration for the book. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So how did you tackle the book? Did you just write it a chapter at a time? Did you you know, write 10 pages at a time? Like, What was the structure? Great question. No one's asked me that yet. As far as writing goes, I would allocate a full weekend because I found once I started writing, I really needed to like keep going at it and I couldn't be writing just 10 pages at a time sort of thing. So I would allocate a whole weekend and lock myself away and tell no one where I was and just head down and write. And so that's why to get those weekends ended up being quite dispersed. But as far as actually the framework of it all goes, it can be quite overwhelming of like, where do you start? And yeah. I got some great frameworks from my publisher who essentially got me to first start thinking about it as big picture sections, which is what ended up being the framework of my book. So I have five different sections. And then within that is how I ended up breaking out my chapters. So the five sections being the foundation, what's out there, what's next doing it yourself and how I did it. So once I got those five segments, it was easier to start bucketing my ideas, information and research within those to build out the chapters. So how did it feel when you uh, submitted the final draft? My final draft was actually quite short on my word count, mm. <laughs> to be honest, my initial one. Mm. Um, but you know what? I'm a tight writer. I'm a journalist. I was a radio broadcaster, right? I was fitting a lot of information in a five minute newscast. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I also felt like there was a lot of, so that my first draft ended up being a couple thousand words short. So I was hoping it was going to be okay. So I thought I was done, but 
I was not. Oh. And so anyway, going back ended up being a little bit tedious. <laughs> but once it actually was done for final, final, it, it didn't really seem real until I had it in my hands. And so there was a bit of time in between where I just thought, like, is this actually going to happen? Is it going to go to print? Am I going to get it? And so the real moment of bliss was when I first held it in my hands. It was quite uh, satisfying. I was quite happy with it. Well, this is my next question. Like, I love asking authors this. When you got the box, when you cracked open that box, man, when you lifted, when you just got in there, what was that feeling? So my publisher actually hand delivered it to me, which I was <laughs> very lucky. So it was her just like, passing me a book in the lobby of my building. I was speechless, which is very rare for me. (laughs) And yeah, it didn't seem real. Even just flipping through it, it just was a very surreal moment for me. It was, uh, yeah, a long time coming, but I'm quite proud of it now. So yeah. As well, you should be. And it's going to help a lot of people. And just all because of your hard work. It's awesome. And your enthusiasm. Well, thanks. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's more so about just spreading the love and spreading the knowledge, right? I think I was meeting so many people that were so enthusiastic about podcasting that they were all asking me the same questions. Mm. And I also teach part-time at Seneca College, a college in Toronto. And so, and I was teaching radio and podcasting and there was no course book that I really found was relevant that was, I had helped rewrite the curriculum to include a lot about podcasting. And I just felt like there was no book that really encompassed everything I wanted it to encompass. So the book also lends itself to that as my course book, which I think is great. It's, there's a real win-win there. And, mm. and it is really just about spreading the knowledge and getting people to podcast and not feel intimidated by it, like really setting them up for success so that the quality of content, I hope, is only going to increase, especially as people start to do their research and maybe get their hands on my book. I've already had some people reach out to me saying that they've read my book, they've launched a podcast because of it, and they've sent me a pilot episode. Love and it. That's yeah, what a rewarding awesome. moment for me. That's the real win. It doesn't matter. Um, even if just, you know, there's a handful of podcasts that get created really well because of the book, then that's uh, the real win. Oh, well deserved. That's like a fist pump right there, you know? Yeah, like, that, <laughs> I think so. That's awesome. Listen, Amanda, this has been awesome. Uh, how can people find out more about you and your book? More about the book, you can go to Let's Talk com, And if you want to learn more about me, you can go to amandacapito.com. Amazing. Amanda, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Awesome. And thank you to everybody for checking out this episode. Enjoy your week. Thank you for listening to the Stand Out Now podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and rate and review it as well. You can find out more about our program at thestandoutnowpodcast.com. Thanks again and enjoy your week.